in the afterglow of Friday evening was so wonderful. The same God that was here Friday evening is here now. Jesus is alive. We're alive. And people often ask me, how are you doing? Well, I'm alive. They look at me. I'm alive in Jesus. <laughs> There's nothing better. I'm not just surviving. I'm thriving. You know, life in this world will never be perfect because we live in an imperfect world. But because He is perfect, He's taking us where He is. We will be also. Go with me to Judges chapter 2. It's beginning to feel good in this place. Because He is inhabiting your praise, your worship, our praise and worship. And it was so wonderful to see so many young people seeking Him Friday evening. But we have young people here today seeking Him. Um, you know, age is just a number. Just a number. Judges 2 and 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And also, thank you, Brother Larkins, for such a great job of the sound system, my friend. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, he wasn't the son of a Nun, he was the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, because that was a dude, Nun, died being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Harris. Aren't you glad you don't live in Timnath Harris? You'd always have to explain to people what that is and how to spell it. Yeah, I live in Timnath Harris. In the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And, here's the sad part, there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord. See how fast it can happen with the Samuels? You know that. Most of you know that. Nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed at other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. Now there's more, but I don't want to keep you standing too long. My thought for the next little bit is never forget the miracle. Never, never forget the miracle. I should say miracles. should put an S on the end of that. May it strengthen your faith. Let's lift our hands for a moment. Jesus, keep our hearts in complete synchronization with your heart, Lord, to keep our eyes on what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. Our eyes are fixed, Lord, on you. Minister here to many hearts and we give you praise and everyone said thank you Jesus yes, thank you. you may be seated and it goes on and it says and they forsook the Lord you imagine the sinking feeling that God felt in his own heart and served Baal and Ashtaroth and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and this is the reality I've always considered myself in a general sense pro-Israel but I don't give them a blank check there have been many times when God, but it was always because God was wanting to bring them back unto Him. It's a lot like parenting. You correct your children because you love them, because you want to keep them on the right path. And He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies whithersoever they went out. 
The hand of the Lord was against them for evils. It's a hard pill to swallow. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, hence the book of Judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. So that's what the whole book of Judges is all about. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. God's people had forgotten him, sadly. And they had forgotten his miraculous power. And how, how, when God has done something for you in your life, or me, or us, how could we forget what God has done? Amen. And yet mankind tends to be forgetful. You know, this is a lot like marriage. When your spouse does something kind for you because they love you, sometimes we forget. Next time you're in the middle of that argument, remember that act of kindness your spouse did and let your heart melt. But we forget. We forget what God has done. We shouldn't. But this is a major key in staying close to Jesus, is never forgetting. I cannot tell you the times that I have been up against a challenge in my life, big or small, medium, and the thing that got me through is when I went to prayer, but specifically to remember what God did for me in the past and to praise Him for what He's already done. Because when you do that, not only do you magnify God, and give glory to God, you remind yourself and you get your faith out of the closet. You dust off your faith and energize your faith that if God did this before, He can do it again. The challenge may be greater, but He can do it again. And even in a greater way. How many of you know that let me ask it let me ask it this way when you went through the first trial in your walk with God you thought it was the biggest trial you would ever face and when you came through it you went Whew, glad that's over if that but if that's as worse as bad as it gets it's not so bad but you realize down the road that was only prepping you for what was coming but God never puts on us more than we can bear. And by the way, God takes zero pleasure in seeing us ever suffer. But He takes a lot of pleasure in watching us trust Him through the trial. But you see, the current thing you're going through, God knows. That may be your maximum of what you can handle now. But remember, your faith is like a muscle. And so, the trial you're going through now, when you overcome it through the power of the name of Jesus and the blood and simply walking with Him, that makes your faith stronger so that next time, huh? You ever look back at something God brought you through? Maybe it was a temptation or just a difficulty, maybe a health situation, maybe a financial situation. And at the time you went through it, it seemed so gargantuanly ginormous. But now you look back and you think, well, that wasn't so bad. But at the time you went through it, it was. Why is it your perspective that way now? Well, number one, you're past it. But number two, your faith is bigger than it used to be. You have more faith than you used to. Because faith is like a muscle. It only grows when you use it. And that's why so many people are lethargic in their faith. Because they're afraid to use what faith you have. 
That's why when the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Lord, give us greater faith. They wanted him to just zap them with greater faith. But he said, no, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, be removed. Jesus was telling them, use the faith you have and it will grow in the midst of putting it to work. Hallelujah. Sadly, God was no longer in their regular thinking. That's another big one. God must be in our regular thinking. That's why daily time in the Word and prayer is so important. Because it keeps God in the forefront of our minds, in our thoughts. Huh? And the enemy understands this. Because the Bible talks about the fiery darts of the enemy. The fiery darts from Satan come in the form of thoughts, negative thoughts, evil thoughts, tempting thoughts. God was no longer in their regular thinking. And this is why cultures often to justify certain anti-God behaviors will remove God from their thinking. That's why you'll often see when God is removed from textbooks or just from culture, what will often follow is human behavior that you would never think would creep into a society, such as the killing of the unborn. So God was no longer their purpose for living. God's presence was no longer the glue that held everything together. In the life of Israel, God's principles were no longer what guided both their daily and long-term decisions. Now you might be able to understand this being the case back in Babylon or back in Egypt, but this is after God had delivered them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And they joined themselves with pagan nations and their idolatry as a result of their evil. Fear instead of faith became their driving force. Satan is a master of putting fear on individuals and societies. Fear has been a tactic used since the beginning of time. So why, after thousands of years of this same vicious cycle being repeated over and over, and it is a vicious cycle, why hasn't mankind today still not learned his lesson? How is it that we have seen cultures, even in our own beloved country of America, watch this happen? And don't get me wrong, I know there are millions of God-fearing people but I'm talking about society and culture at large. They had forgotten all the countless times the Lord had delivered, provided, and protected them. And as a result, God felt the disrespect of being forgotten. Similar to when a parent feels the disrespect of spending years providing for their children and their children act like they don't exist. That's the ultimate disrespect. And God had to deliver me from that when I was 14, 15 years old. But what he did may seem harsh to some. But we have to understand the harsh chains they were in. And sometimes God has to take harsh measures because the circumstances are harsh. But this is actually what we see happening in our world today. That is, God delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And I speak for, because I'm American, I don't speak for the whole of America, but I'm saying because I live in this country, I see what's happening. But this is actually on a worldwide scale happening in every nation. And that is, but specifically America, and I believe America is prophesied, you know that, but there's good and bad. And if America continues on the path of rejecting God, America will no longer be a sovereign country. God could very well deliver the United States into uh, the power of another, such as China or the UN, or we're already in that, or the EU or something. But I'm just saying that there are some in power that want that. 
And, but strangely enough, in Judges 6, the Midianites were actually distant relatives of the children of Israel because after Abraham's wife Sarah died, Abraham married a woman named Keturah, and she gave him six additional sons, and one of them was Midian. So if you think about it, actually, they were cousins. But if Israel had just continued following the Lord, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, we all have family, no doubt. Whether there be close family or distant family, who are not walking with Jesus. And we love them, we pray for them, but we can't make them live for God. But you live for God, you have chosen to live for God in spite of those in your oikos. Oikos is the Greek word for your circle of influence. Regardless of those in your oikos who perhaps have rejected the God you serve or maybe they just have put God out of their knowledge, which is dangerous, or perhaps for whatever reasons they just... Maybe they didn't have the upbringing you have, or maybe they just have chosen not to commit to God. And you love them, but you have chosen, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. But in Judges chapter 6, as a result of the stronghold that Midian had over Israel, they went into the mountains and lived in caves to try and escape the oppression from the Midianites because they had to. Because the Midianites, one of their tactics was to prevent the children of Israel from growing crops. And any cultural society that can't grow food will starve to death. It is actually a tactic of war, starving out your enemy. It's actually going on today. Bill Gates owns more uh, land in the United States than any U.S. citizen. And this has been a tactic that has gone on for a long time. Mao Zedong starved millions of his own people in China. But it had gotten so bad that Israel couldn't even grow crops because of all their enemies, the ites. And they would simply, they would, if they did grow crops, they would destroy their crops that they had grown. Without crops, there's no food. Without food, the people starve. And so do the livestock and the sheep and the cattle. And that's exactly what was happening. Mission accomplished. Interestingly, that it actually mentions Gaza in Judges chapter 6 and verse 4. Gaza is very much a part of the biblical original promised land. In fact, the way the enemies of Israel were described are that they came into the land like grasshoppers. In other words, there was a huge multitude of the enemies of Israel. The enemies of Israel and their camels, the Bible says, were without number. The Bible specifically says that Israel's enemies came into their land to destroy it. I'm reminded of the scripture where the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Satan has always used the tactic of coming in large numbers to intimidate, to put fear, and to take over. But God doesn't gain his victories through mathematical larger numbers. In fact, God delights in gaining victory when it looks like the odds are stacked up against his people because God never wants us to think that we gain victory through our own strength, but through his miraculous intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. John 10 and 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said the counter, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus gives us life in the midst of what appears to be total destruction. And Judges chapter 6 and verse 6, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. The children of Israel, though, there was always hope. Here, something was sparked in their minds and hearts. There's a way out. The situation looks desperate and hopeless, but there's a way out. So now they begin again to start to do the right thing. As long as there's breath in your lungs, my brothers and sisters, there is hope to begin again. Because the Bible says when it got this bad, they cried unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And you know if you're a parent what it's like when one of your offspring, they come to you. They may not have listened to you before. They may have disobeyed you before. 
They may have been rebellious with a bad attitude before, but when they come back after circumstances have wrecked their ship, and they come back humbled, and they recognize I was wrong, what do you do? Because you love them as their parent, you wrap your arms of love, you squeeze them with a hug and tears, and you say, I love you, I'm here for you, let's start again, let's start all over again, and new life is sparked. Woo! I feel hope in this place. So when, when Israel cried out unto the Lord, did God send them a psychiatrist? <laughs> I, I'm not against Dr. Laura. I don't even know if she's still doing her thing or not. But she was pretty tough. We used to listen to her some in the 90s, back when we actually had radios. And we'd tune in sometimes to Dr. Laura after Rush was over or whatever. And she was very smart and wise, but she had her limits. Sometimes she would offend. It's like, why are you calling in? You know, you want truth, but you want, you want cotton candy, whatever. But did God... You know, I'm not against Christian psychologists, but did God send them a psychiatrist that would just give them a prescription to pills and say, here, this will make you feel better. Here, take this for your depression. No, because it'll make you more depressed in the end. Did God put them on a bunch of big pharma meds and say, here, forget your pain? Did God say, go get drunk and forget your pain? No, God sent them a prophet. God sent them a man of God who would speak the truth to them. But last time I checked, see, they want to dumb down truth. They want us to think that truth is relative. That you have your truth and I have my truth. And look, I understand there's circumstantial truth in terms of, well, my tire got flat because of my treads and all of this. Or my tire went flat because it was defective from the manu manufacturing. They want us to think, oh, that's the only kind of truth there is. It's relative truth. Or you define your own truth. No. You see, that's Satan I'm not talking about circumstantial truth. We're not talking about what may be, oh, well, you have weeds in your yard because of this, and you don't because you used weed and feed, and you have weeds because you haven't paid attention to your yard. No, that's, we're not talking about circumstantial truth. We're talking about doctrinal, rock-solid truth that never changes because God doesn't change and His Word doesn't change. But that's the kind of truth they're messing with. They always say, well, if you want to believe that marriage is between one man and one woman and it's for life, fine. But, you know, what about someone else has their truth? No, that's not truth because there's only one truth. But because they've removed God from the equation, truth is open game. But no, it's not because at the end of the day, they can't really change truth. <laughs> you see, you understand. You understand what I'm trying to say. You know, it's like, some things you can't change. You know, you, you try to water your plants with bleach and what, what's, watch what happens. Or acid, you'll kill your plants. You know, they, they, these people get whacked out, right? It's like, oh, gravity still exists. Well, who made it? Amen. What's the first thing the prophet did? The first thing. I mean, did, did he get a rocket launcher and blow the people sky high? No. He reminded the people of Israel how God had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. The first thing the prophet did is he reminded them of what God has already done. But as you were saying, until they cried to the Lord, they weren't ready to receive it because their hearts were not open. There were many truths that Jesus withheld until he knew he was talking to people that were ready to receive it. Jesus didn't give them everything all the time, all at once. But he gave them bits and pieces. He gave them what they were ready to receive. You know, sometimes you just have to love somebody and be their friend and be kind to them. And I have learned through the years, and I didn't always have this wisdom in the beginning, that you give people what they ask for. So that when someone asks you a question about a particular subject about God or the Bible, what they're really telling you is, I'm hungry, even if it may seem the simplest little thing. I, they're opening the door. They're opening the door in that way. Well, one thing leads to another. And if you give them the right biblical truth in that area, that means that could lead to something else in the maze of life of trying to figure out what our existence is all about. 
But because Israel had forgotten the miracles of yesterday, they were in this quandary. And that's the first thing the prophet did. He just said, before we can go any further, you've got to stop and give God praise for what He's already done for you. Oh, Hallelujah. Never forget the miracles. Never forget what God has done because if you forget, fear will settle in. This, why, this is why it is so important when we pray that we take time to simply offer thanks for everything He's already done. In fact, in your prayer time, if you never do anything else but give God praise for what He's done, your time was not wasted. And I know we have our list of prayer requests. Nothing wrong with that. We have our list of people we're praying for. Nothing wrong with that. The Bible tells us, ask and we shall receive. But in my own time, and I do, I have my prayer Routine, if you please. And I try not to be ritualistic. I try to mix it up. I, I try uh, to just be real with God. But there are times, I'll have times of prayer. Or I say, okay, God, yesterday I asked you to do these certain things. Yesterday I prayed for these certain people. And I'm sure tomorrow I'll pray for some more people and stuff. But today, Lord, I'm going to have a prayer Sabbath. Does that mean I don't pray? No. What I mean by that, it's a personal thing God gave me, is that I take some time, and it's not always the same day, it's not always exact, but I'll feel led in the Spirit to just, today, I'm just going to praise God. Today, I'm just going to worship Him. Today, I'm just going to love Him. And if that turns in, Brother Samuels, to praying in the heavenly language we call tongues, so be it. But I'm just going to take some time to say, God, because when I do that, I'm telling God, I have not forgotten. And I will not let myself forget. I will not let myself forget. Even if you have to use a sticky note or put a memo in your phone, somewhere where you know you're going to see it. And put a sticky note every once in a while on your fridge or on the dash of your car, even if it's just a few words. Remember when God healed me. Remember when God provided financially. Remember when God healed this relationship. Remember. Maybe even put the date of when the breakthrough happened. Write the date of when the, the answer to prayer came to pass. Somehow. I know we live in a digital age, so use your phone to make yourself notes of, of when God answered prayers and came through with miracles. But America is in trouble because in many ways, as much as we love this country, America has forgotten God. Now, I know that's not everybody. And like I said, I believe it's the millions and millions of Christians still living in this country as God-fearing citizens that have not forgotten God that has kept God's hand of judgment from really, and I pray it doesn't happen. But in Judges 6.11, Gideon's father was Joash, and one of Gideon's chores was to thresh wheat. <laughs> they actually worked back then, and they worked hard. And I know a lot of people work hard today, but it seems like a lot of people have forgotten what work is, and especially where food comes from. And they, he, they had to thresh the wheat. They didn't have modern machinery and tractors and all of that. They had to do it by hand. I've never threshed wheat, but I understand it's a very tough job. <laughs> and it's a painstaking job. And it takes a long time to do it, just to get a small amount. And the oppression was so bad, they had to thresh wheat in secret. They did it at Gideon's household behind the wine press, the Bible says, so they weren't visible to the Midianites. That's how bad it was. They were afraid the Midianites would see them successfully growing crops and they would come and destroy it. And all of a sudden, I love, as Gideon is threshing wheat, the angel of the Lord appears on the scene and sits down under an oak tree on Joash's ranch. And this angel looks at Gideon and he tells him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. But you know what? At first, I don't think Gideon knew it was an angel. And I love this. Everyone can identify with Gideon's response. And this is why I think Gideon maybe hadn't fully registered yet. Gideon's like, well, 
if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And it's, e it's easy while, you know, we're sitting in our chair reading the Bible to think about these people. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? But when you're the one, a part of a situation where your enemy is starving you out and you're having to thresh just to survive in secret, I can understand. We've all heard these kinds of responses. Some of us have given these kinds of responses. Perhaps you've been that person. I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I've heard pastor talk about that before. But if God is real and His love is real, we sometimes try to put the pieces together. And we sometimes allow our doubtful mind to kick in and say, well, I've heard that all my life. Why is my life so difficult? Guess what else Gideon said in this, in this moment? He said, where are all of his miracles? <laughs> Ever heard that before? Ever said that during difficult times? What do you think some of our ancestors said during the Great Depression nearly a century ago? Do you think they ever wondered where God was? It's easy to say, yeah, I trust in God when we have everything. Even Satan understood that before the Lord when he stood before him. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, remove everything from him. Remove the hedge you have around him. And he will curse you to your face. The good news is, in Revelation 12.10, that the accuser, Satan, is going to be cast down in the end. Amen. Gideon's basic mindset and attitude was that the Lord had forsaken them. But Gideon still had hope in his soul. And again, if we had been in Gideon's shoes, we might have felt the same way. But there's got to be a turnaround. So the angel told Gideon to go and deliver Israel from the Midianites. Now, hold on just a second. <laughs> hold on. I just said that God is nowhere to be found among us, and yet you're telling us, whoever you are, to go gain a great victory. Again, this is why I don't think Gideon fully understood this was an angel. <laughs> Gideon wasn't convinced, because that sounds like a giant flying leap across the Grand Canyon. Here we're going, we're on the brink of destruction, and you want us to go get victory against the Midianites, and we can't even feed our, lot, our, our, our families, let alone our, uh, our, our soldiers. Gideon he, it was, was really struggling. How can I save Israel when my clan is the weakest? And I'm the least in my father's house. See what God is doing? God is choosing the one who seemed to be the least qualified. In other words, Gideon was the weakest compared to his brothers. So why was God choosing him? And he said, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. The angel was just God's spokesperson. He was just God's messenger. Gideon was just as human as you and I. He said, show me a sign that it's you. So Gideon made a deal with the angel. He said, wait right here. I'll be back. Gideon did that. Exit stage left. Pew! He said, I'm going to get my offering. I'm going to set it right in front of you. <laughs> Hang on, let me go to my offering. I left it in my car. The angel said, don't worry, I'll be waiting right here. Can you see the angel? He's probably 10 feet tall. And he's just like... Does that sound familiar? If you have forgotten God, he's still right where you left him. Waiting for you because God is omnipresent. He has not left you. God has not left those who have left him. So Gideon prepared a goat, bread, and broth. And Gideon gets back with his offering, and the angel said, Lay the meat and bread on this rock and pour out the broth. And the angel takes his staff, touches the meat, and bread and fire came out and consumed Fire came out of the rock and consumed the meat and the bread. It's probably one of the first barbecues. One of the first barbecue grills. I think it's at this point Gideon realized, wow, this has got to be an angel. 
And then the angel took off. Isn't that what they always do? They always do that. Whew, they're gone. You know? I don't even think they have capes. And they just go. And Gideon realizes he was actually face to face with an angel of God. And that feeling of amazement suddenly came upon him. It's better than Superman or any of the marvels. They're fake, but this is real. And then the Lord tells Gideon directly to tear down the altar of Baal, tear down the wooden image, want to be restored in your relationship with God, destroy the idols and the false gods out of your life. And even things that are not necessarily sinful can become idols. I'm not against sports, I'm not against hobbies, I'm not against doing fun things, I'm not against hunting, I'm not against fishing, I'm not against golf, and I'm not, I'm not against sports. But unfortunately in our society, a lot of people have made idols out of things that may not be inherently wrong, but they give all their time, all their energy, all their money, and all their clothing to it. And it becomes an idol to them. And, I mean... Celebrities become idols. Celebrities get put on pedestals. People that can't do for society what people expect. No wonder why celebrities take their own lives. And I know they don't all do that. But God told Gideon to sacrifice a bull. Think about it. Their enemies were destroying all their food. Israel was on the brink of starvation. And this God of yours is requiring that you sacrifice a bull that could feed an entire village. But God said, God says, put me first and watch me give the increase. You see, God's math is not our math. We calculate in addition. God calculates in multiplication. This carnal, anti-faith mindset also plagued some of Jesus' disciples in Matthew 26 when the woman brought the alabaster jar of expensive perfume. The disciples were irritated and said, Lord, it could be sold to be given to the poor. And it sounded like a good motive. But Jesus said, you always have the poor with you, which sounds cold, but that's missing the point. What he was saying is she's preparing my body for the burial, which is only going to happen once. You see, how many of you know there are many things we face in life that are one-time things? Yeah. Noah's flood was a one-time thing. Yeah. One-time thing. Build an ark, you're crazy, you're nuts, but this is only going to ha happen once. Trust me, trust me. Understandably, when tearing down the altar of Baal, that was a big deal because everybody was doing this just to keep the Midianites from destroying them, including Gideon's own father. But Gideon's father did not like it. He didn't want to have an altar to Baal in his backyard. But the angel said, destroy it. Do you think it went through Gideon's mind? What's dad going to think when, when he wakes up? And so when the men of the city got up early in the morning and saw the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image and the sacrifice, they began to go nuts. Someone, someone said, uh, it was Gideon that did it. And they said, bring out your son. Talking to his dad, Jesse, bring out your son. And they weren't, they weren't beating around the bush. They weren't, they, they weren't playing games. They said, sir, we're going to kill your son because he's destroyed the altar of Baal. He's destroyed the altar of sacrifice. But Gideon's dad, Joash, came to his son's defense and he's like, would you plead for Baal? <laughs> would you save him? Would you plead for a dead, can't do anything for you, God? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. In other words, who of you really think Baal is real? Who of you really would put your trust in Baal? I think it was probably silence with crickets chirping. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down and my brothers and sisters, the war was on. And the Midianites and the Amalekites encamped in the valley of Jezreel because Gideon did not forget what God could do and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. He blew the trumpet and you know, blowing the trumpet is the call to battle. At least it was then. And the men of Israel came from all around to go out to battle. And I love how Gideon wanted to make for absolute certain that going out to battle was of God. So he did the fleece thing twice. Two times he did the fleece thing. And it's funny because I think Gideon was a little OCD. 
He already had an angel appear to him that miraculously took his offering up. You would think the appearance of the angel would have been enough. Okay, so no, he did this OCD thing where he's like, okay, I'm going to do the fleece thing. You know, dry wool and wet ground and vice versa, reverse, you know. And God did both. But sometimes we need a little confirmation in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. You know, and he wrung out that bowl full of water that wrung out the wool. But Gideon had a touch uh, of, of, of uncertainty and wanted to make super certain, you know, because OCD will drive you crazy. But when he had the assurance and he knew there was no question and God helped him and God worked with him and God gave him what he really shouldn't have had to have, but he needed to have it, you know, did that for Thomas too. And so then that gave Gideon the assurance that this was of God. Why was Gideon able to approach situations with this kind of faith? Because Gideon understood that as a child, you never allow yourself to forget what God has done because soon as, as soon as we allow ourselves to forget the goodness of God, we begin to lose faith for the present. Amen. You see, so many times, I love Pentecostals, I'm one of us. But so many times we're looking for the big thing, the big thing, and the big thing. And we all believe God can do giant, big things that are beyond our scope. Yes, God does big things. Praise God. But sometimes we miss the little things because we're only focused on the stars in outer space. And God says, look at the miracles and the prayers I'm answering right in front of you. Hallelujah. So Gideon was good to go into battle because now he's prepared with 32,000 highly trained soldiers. That's all we need, right? Brother Larkins, right? Pastor Wolf, right? Brother Samuels, 32,000 men, you're good to go. That's all you need, right? 32,000, and we're going to take them by storm. We're going to have sure victory. But wait, what's that I hear? It's the voice of God, and he's got a message for Gideon. Hang on, I'm sending you... More men just in case. More weapons. More provision just in case the war drags out. Great. Except that's the opposite of what God told Gideon. In fact, the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many. Wait, hang on. We may have 32,000, but they may have hundreds of thousands. They may have millions because the Bible describes the enemy as grasshoppers and camels and whatever else they had. What do you mean? We're going to reduce our numbers from 32,000 down but this is why God did it that way. This is why God reduced Gideon's numbers in his troops. He said, I have to do this lest Israel claim glory for themselves. Saying, my own hand has saved me. Because if Israel thought their own hand saved them, they wouldn't give glory to God and they wouldn't count it as something, a victory God gave and they would go right back to forgetting God again. God let them get in this situation to bring them back to a place of repentance, period, which is why they cried out to God. And he said, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And immediately, the Bible says, 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. God immediately disqualified two-thirds of the soldiers. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. <laughs> What do you mean? Bring them down to the water and I will test them there for you. And then it will be that of whom I say to you, there is one, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomsoever I say to you, this one shall not go, the same shall not go. So he brought the people to the water and the Lord said, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you. In other words, in the midst of battle, you don't have time to relax and say, we're just going to chill and get our eyes off the battle. No, you had to be like this. Go. Go. And God said, those are the 300, Gideon, because they're ready-minded. They've got their finger on the trigger, and they're ready to go. they got their eyeball in the scope. they got their finger in the trigger, and they're ready, and they're with you. And so he had 300, which was like 
a group of little grasshoppers or insects, but it was enough. It was all he needed. And God said, I've already given you victory. It's in the bank. But if you're afraid, it's not going to work. I love how God understands when we're nervous about the battles we face and God equips us to gain victory. But if you're afraid to go down, go down. God understood they were afraid. He said, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they shall say. So they were afraid. God said, I've got a way. This is going to work. Go down with my servant, Pura, and listen to... In other words, Pura was a spy for Israel. And he said, listen to the enemy. And he said, when you get a sense of what's going on. And they went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. And when Midian and the Amalekites and all the people of the east, they're lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, the Bible says... Their camels were without number. And Gideon had come into the camp. And there was a man telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I have a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread, this is really a two-part series, tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to the tent and struck it so hard that it fell and overturned. And the tent collapsed. And his companion answered and said, This is nothing but the sword of Gideon and the son of Joash and the man of Israel into his hand, God has delivered Midian. And so God gave Gideon the plan of the, uh, of the lamps and telling the 300 to go into the camp at night and at the appointed time when he sounds the trumpet, he's going to break the lamps with the torches. And what God was doing was making it seem as though they had hundreds of thousands of men when they only had 300. And here's what God did. This happened in the middle of the night. And the enemy thought, when they were all sleeping, weren't ready for this, they all thought that the children of Israel had way, way, way more than they really had. And it took them by surprise. And what did they do? They wound up turning on each other. Soldieristic cannibalism. In other words, they started fighting each other and killing each other. You see, if you'll trust God, the Lord will take care of your enemies. And the rest is history. And he said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. And I kind of condensed what happened. But I want you to know, your key to victory is to never forget the thousands of prayers God has answered in your life. The thousands of miracles God has done in your life. The key to your next answer to prayer, the key to your next miracle is to praise God. For the miracles He's already done in your life. Would you stand with me right now? God wants to give several in this building breakthroughs. I wonder if we could quickly filter out from our seats. I know I went a little longer perhaps than normal. But I wanted to drive this home. I wonder if we could all filter out from our seats and quickly make our way down these aisles. And find a place in His presence right now. As we wrap this up. And if you need a supernatural touch from God. Just lift your hands to heaven. And say, Jesus, I'm right here. Jesus, I make a firm commitment. That I am not going to allow myself. Come on, make this your prayer. I refuse to forget, Jesus, what you've done. And Lord, we lift our voices to You right now to give You praise for every time You answered, for every time You healed, for every time You provided, and for every time You gave us a breakthrough. Bless His name. Bless His name, child of God. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. 
All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness 